This is your coffee break. Hi, friends. I am back again this week for another coffee break with yours truly, Sarah Warner, and our guest for the week, who is a business and book coach. She's very accomplished. I think we're going to have a great conversation ahead of us here. I'd love to introduce to you Honoré Corder. She's the best-selling author of more than a dozen books, including her newest book, Prosperity for Writers, A Writer's Guide to Creating Abundance, which I love that title, and I can't wait to hear more about it. Her book provides writers with the techniques, tools, and ideas that you need to revolutionize your writing business and beliefs. For almost 20 years, Honoré has served professionals and entrepreneurs as a coach, mentor, and strategic advisor. She empowers people to shed their limiting beliefs, dream big, and go for what they truly want, which is one of the reasons I am so excited to introduce her to you today. So please welcome Honoré. Hi, thank you so much for having me. What a lovely intro. And then when you said 20 years, I was like, who's that? (laughs) I know it goes by fast, doesn't it? It so does. Well, Honoré, would you like to say just a few things? I mean, that that little intro probably cannot hold all of the wonderful things that you've done. So anything else you'd like to add about yourself? Oh, gosh, thank you so much for asking. I am I did not fancy myself a writer. And so I love talking to people about writing and encouraging them to become a writer because I, for a long time, called myself a lower W writer, case writer, because I didn't go to NYU and I didn't have a fancy journalism or creative writing degree. And it wasn't until like my seventh book that a good friend of mine said, you know, you could lead with that author thing. Like, that's kind of a cool (laughs) thing. (laughs) You know, it's kind of true. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm totally good with it now, but I love encouraging those people who are not quite as far along on the path as I am with all of my years, as we've discovered. <laughs> so um, just encouraging people to, to take the leap and, and do what they want to do, regardless of how young or old they might happen to be. I love that. That is exactly what this show is all about. And I love that you started off with the lowercase, uppercase writer thing. That's something I talk about a lot. And I encourage people to identify themselves as an uppercase W writer. Do you have anything that can help push people from the lowercase to the uppercase? Well, it in it's in a, a moment that our decisions are made. And really, it's there is nothing to do. There's no box you have to check, no certification you have to get, no degree, and no permission other than maybe what we're going to give them, us, right? Maybe mm-hmm. it could be right here on this podcast. Right you now. Know. Yeah, absolutely. To be a capital, capital W writer and to take ownership of it. Because honestly, it just comes down to when you take ownership of it. And you say it. And then people go, hey, that's kind of cool. I've always wanted to be a writer. Tell me about that. And then you just say, hey, guess what? You are a writer with a capital W right now in this moment. Yes. And you want to hear something ironic is I have a co-author. Her name is Grace Boscos, and she was an assistant to a lady that I coached when I lived in Las Vegas and she wanted to become a writer. So the gal that I was working with said, Hey, would you do me a solid? Would you work with Grace? And I took Grace out to lunch and I made her stand up in the restaurant and say, I am a writer. (laughs) (laughs) I've written my first book. I just said, you know, if you want to be a writer, then you have to claim that you're a writer. And so I made her do it. And then it took me seven books, ironically. (laughs) Thing. I just didn't, I didn't see it. Like that was her thing, right? She had gone to school to become a writer. She was a food critic. She was a foodie. She was, you know, big and important in my, in my head. And I was encourage her, encouraging her as her coach to take ownership of that. And so if someone needs permission, we've given it. But other than that, there's really nothing you need to do other than just be a writer. I absolutely love that. Isn't it interesting how, I don't know how blind we are to what we can do or blind we are to our potential and how easy it is for us to look at someone else and say, well, of course you're a writer, but me never. Right. So it's easy. Yes. It's easy to give other people permission and encouragement, whereas it seems to be much harder for us to do it for ourselves. Exactly. So I'd love to ask you how you got started with writing. Well, um, I have always written, but I did not, as I said, I did not fancy myself a writer. When I was encouraged to write a book for the first time, it was because Mark Victor Hansen, who you might know is the co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had met him at a conference and I was sitting in the back because I'm, I'm a nerd, everybody. So I was sitting in the back. Take- <laughs> 
And he came back and he said, who are you and what do you do? And I was, you know, all proud and sassy pants, right? And I said, oh, I'm a coach and a speaker. And he just kind of looked at me and he was like, yeah, everybody's a coach and a speaker. So what? Like, you need a book. You have to write a book. And I was like, write a book? Oh, my gosh. That's harsh. You know, how hard could that be? He wasn't meaning it that way. But it was just kind of like I was all like, woohoo, this is what I do. And he, he, you know, very nicely explained to me that, kind of everyone said that. And if everyone says something, then no one knows who to give the credibility to. Nobody knows who's better Mm. at the coach and the speaking thing, right? So I asked him a few more questions. And among the advice he gave me was to take a speech that I had given that was popular and to write it down and to make it a book. And so I had organized my speech. So I organized my book. That's awesome. (laughs) Looking back, I kind of, you know, SMH, shake my head, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know what I didn't know. And there was so much, but I did it anyway. And I sold some copies. And then I kind of got the bug after that. So it took a few more years for me to write another book because I didn't know I was a writer yet. I love that, though. I love that you just did it. Well, that's the thing is I didn't know what I didn't know, which was both helpful I I didn't put a limitation on it because there was no one saying, and this is, when people say they get into self-publishing early, this was really early. My first self-published book was 2004. Mm -hmm. So this was before, almost before Kindle. Like I remember putting my book up and getting an email from Amazon saying, do you want to do this digital book thing? And I barely remember doing it. (laughs) And then I remember having a client say, hey, I bought your book on Kindle. And I was like, what's a Kindle? And you're the only one. And yay, right? And years went by. And Amazon finally caught up with me and they said, you know, you have some royalties. We can't pay you. (laughs) And that was a That was a fun day um, to get my first, you know, five years of royalty and one direct deposit because I didn't know that I had royalties, which is another conversation. That whole you don't know what you don't know thing can really be a hindrance. Also, that that was the story of my first book. I kind of got inspired in 2009, so a few years later, to write the first single mom book. So I wrote the first book in the Successful Single Mom book series. The, and of course, that didn't go anywhere for a couple of years. And so more encouraging words for the listeners, which is nothing nothing takes as short a period of time as you would like it to take. Everything's going to take longer, cost more money, and require more effort. And so what? Just keep doing it because mm-hmm. eventually, eventually it became a best-selling book. That's awesome. Congrats for that. You know, year 75, we made it. (laughs) (laughs) But the good news is there's no deadline on it, right? If you're a a self-published author, then you can put up a book and it can take as long as it needs to take to gain traction because you don't have that 12-week make it or break it. And it, it did take a long time. I mean, long after I had kind of you know, throwing the, almost throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I just kind of left it up on Amazon. And I'm like, hmm, just go back to the other thing. <laughs> so just yeah. out of sheer determination. Yes. Well, I just left it up there. And then eventually, you know, Amazon would order because I'm in the Advantage program because I had to order thousands of copies and have them delivered to my house. This is pre-Create Space. And so I had the thousands of copies in my garage. And so they would order, you know, 12 copies. And I'm like, yes. And then I would mail off 12 copies. And then the next month they would order 15 copies. And I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And then the number just kept increasing and increasing. And then it wasn't every month. It was every week. And now I think like twice a day or not twice a day, twice a week, I get an order from Amazon (laughs) Advantage for books. And then I traipse up to the post office with my package and mail off the books. And as soon as I've run out of those thousands of copies, finally, (laughs) that I ordered (laughs) in 2010... I'm going to switch over to Great Space. Awesome. So what were you doing in the meantime? So so you weren't really necessarily generating revenue from these books during this time. You had a five-year span while you were waiting for your first royalty check. What were you doing? Well, so I was a business coach and a speaker. So my main hustle was business coaching. So I would coach executives. And my first book, Tall Order, the first version of Tall Order, which I just released the 10th anniversary version of that last year. So I read the book, revised, expanded, included all the stuff I didn't know. Cool. (laughs) 10 years ago. Um, I actually sold 11,000 copies of that book when it came out. I was happy and sold a bunch of copies of it because I didn't know that you weren't supposed to do that. I thought everybody went out and sold a whole bunch of copies of their book. So I did that. And then later someone said, you know, that was kind of a big deal. 
And I, I didn't know. Right. So, um, I've been business coaching, executive coaching, corporate training and speaking for all of these years. And when I turned 40 in 2010, I started to get those direct deposits, those royalties. And I thought there's something to this. I really like it. I'm going to see if I can make a go of it. And so in five years time, by the time I turned 45, I wanted my side hustle to be my main hustle. So keep coaching, keep speaking, keep showing up, keep working. And meantime, write a few books a year. And by the time I turned 43, I had had the crossover point. So in Prosperity for Writers, which you talked about in the intro, I talk about figuring out what your nut is, your monthly nut. And your monthly nut's the the amount of money you need to make to pay your bills. So I have had a few different careers. And in each one of those careers, I like to create a, a stream of income that will cover my monthly nut. So you do that. And then you create another one. You create another one. So pretty soon you're making more than what you're needing to live on. That's a fun game, right? Awesome. Yeah. Yes. And so I decided when I turned 40 that that my royalties weren't a lot. I had sold that big chunk of books and I would sell 100 books here and 100 books there and and people were starting to order on Amazon. But it wasn't what it is today. You know, back in the day when I was walking uphill both ways. (laughs) So, kids. (laughs) Right. I could see where it was going. I could see that having a device that you could read on was really cool and that you could carry as many books as you wanted to carry. And then there was the iPhone. I could just kind of see where things were going or I thought I could. It turns out I w- turns out I was right. How cool is that? That's pretty awesome. Yes. I give you points for that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take those points. <laughs> and I also recognized that I didn't want to work forever trading time for money because my first business was network marketing where you learn to, to build leveraged income. And I knew that intellectual property was leveraged income. Yes. And so I wanted to grow that. And so I was writing and writing and writing, but I recognized one month that what I would be making in 60 days time when the royalties came in would be more than enough to cover my nut. I know that a lot of writers come to writing as artists there for the sake of their art. And a lot of us don't have a lot of good business sense, myself included. I was a poetry major, actually. And um, I was like, oh, art for art's sake and money is blah, blah, blah. And, you know, then then you graduate from college and you realize that money is important to live. And so can you tell me a little bit about the difference between being a struggling artist and being a writer who can actually support themselves and generate that monthly nut? Well, the difference is the mindset. So you recognized perhaps that it didn't have to be art just for art's sake. It'd be, you could do well from doing something good from your creativity and that there's nothing wrong with that. And so in general, the, the entire reason that I wrote prosperity for writers and then the journal that goes with it is because I want people to do what they love and recognize that they can make an abundance of money from that and do what they love full time. It doesn't have to be a side hustle. It doesn't have to be, I was watching iron chef kids version, this cute kitty was like, 13. And he said, you know, I'm either going to be a chef or an accountant. And I was like, oh, dear. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I was like, and I could just tell that he really, really, really wanted to be a chef. But somebody had told him that being an accountant was the practical thing to do and that you would make money being an accountant, but Mm -hmm. maybe being a chef, not so much. Mm -hmm. That was the message that I got from this kid watching the show. And it's the same thing that writers are told, not necessarily explicitly, but definitely implicitly, right? Where it's implied that if you're going to be an artist of any kind, that you're going to be a starving artist. That if you say to your mom, mom, I'm going to Hollywood. She's like, go, go to law school. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just in case it doesn't work out. And I wanted to be the voice uh, who could say, look, I didn't get the degree to fall back on. I've just studied business and studied mindset and studied success. And you know, the harder and smarter I work, the luckier I get. Mm -hmm. But I'm not a unicorn. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing different about me than anyone else who wants to go down this path also. But I also recognize that I needed to continue to work until I hit that crossover point. Yes. And I'm still trying to quit. I still have clients. (laughs) (laughs) Still trying to quit the coaching, but I still have people who want to hire me that I really like and want to help. So 
So we're, I'm still in the game, even though I hit that crossover point. But more and more, I'm talking to people who are publishing and grateful for the chance to publish on Amazon and other online platforms where they can then quit doing the thing that they don't love to do that's supporting them while they build their writing business. They, the disconnect there is very simply just a mind shift from, I don't think that that's possible to, hmm, well, if it's possible for this person... It could be possible for me. So one of the things that I talk about in the book is something called the bolo, Ooh. which stole from crime dramas. If you, if you watch a crime drama, there's a, there's a dead body, and the police officer will say, we're going to put out a bolo on the suspect, which means be on the lookout for. Oh. So if you want to believe that it's possible for you to make a living from your writing, then you have to bolo. You have to be on the lookout for other people making a living from their writing. Tell me more about that. Well, bolo is just the the kind of my hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> it was something simple that I wanted that people could remember, right? What am I supposed to What am I supposed to do? How do I make this mind shut shift? It seems so hard, and really, it comes down to I want to I I will find what I seek, and if what I am seeking is what I want, then I will find it, and there are all kinds of evidence out there of people who are making a living from their art, whether they're poets or they're freelance writers or they're screenwriters or they're self-published authors or they're self-published authors who went traditional publishing or traditional published authors who went self-publishing or there's the hybrid authors and there's the romance authors and there's the genre agnostic fiction authors, right? You got everybody. Oh, yeah. Got all these people and they are, you know, one day at a time, one month at a time saying, okay, this is my month. I went full time. I'm having a $10,000 month. And they're doing the things that need to be done. So then you can bolo about what are the activities that work. You want to build your list and build your fan base and do your Facebook ads if you're so inclined to do that and and have a podcast or be on a podcast or 700. (laughs) (laughs) Have Have you been on a lot of podcasts? I've done a few podcasts, you know, <laughs> writing blog posts, you know, having a newsletter, starting a Facebook group, all of these things that that you can do, have a Twitter account, have an Instagram account, have a website, <laughs> write, publish, repeat, yeah. <laughs> all of those things. So you're boloing for people who are doing those things and you're also boloing for the things that they're doing. So what are the successful full-time writers and authors doing that I should be doing and then where are they? Where are all these people that are that are making money from their writing? And let me talk to them and let me listen to what they're doing and pick up some encouragement and some insight into things that I should be doing. So that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. I love that because they're they're showing you a path that has been proven because they are successful. So just making sure that the person you're bellowing for is successful. Right. So if you want to look for starving artists, that you can. <laughs> Right. You you can find the people that are struggling, but they're usually the people that aren't writing the words every day, that are not building their platform, that are not, you know, hugging and loving on their readers and putting out lots of content. They're the people that are hanging out in forums and complaining <laughs> about the people that are successful. So you want to avoid that and just really focus on looking for more of what it is that you want. I love that message. I love that so much. I love that. One of the things, so while we're talking about looking at being a prosperous author and being successful and kind of following in the footsteps of other successful authors, your book talks about four hurdles to becoming a prosperous author. Do you want to talk about those a little bit for us? Sure. So we've talked a little bit about the first one, which is think. So you have to get over the think hurdle. Do I think that it might be possible maybe, you know, on a sunny day in Miami, (laughs) If I'm facing east on a Tuesday at sunset, <laughs> is it possible that maybe I could be a writer, a successful, prosperous writer? And if you can just open the door just a smidgey, you don't have to throw it open. Don't get crazy. But if you can think just for a second that it's possible for you, that's the very first step. Thinking. And I'm then nodding. You, you can't see me, but I'm just, I'm nodding. I, with me. I can feel it. And <laughs> the, next, the next hurdle is the believe hurdle. Do I believe that it's possible for me? Because it's different to open the door a smidge to believing that it's actually possible for you. Right. I appreciate that distinction. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I can think it, but I don't know if I believe it. So then we have the next one, which I think might be the hardest one, which is, do I believe that I deserve Mm -hmm. to be 
prosperous writer. So you can clearly hear from my story that I was seven books in making money as a writer. And I still didn't say, oh, I'm an author and a speaker and a coach. I would say, oh, I'm a coach and a speaker. And my friend would say, and she's a bo- she's an author too. She has books. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, the book thing. Those are great too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So I wasn't quite to the, do I think I deserve it for, for a, a little ways in. And so you've got to work on your deservability and, and the, here's an asterisk and a hint and then like under double underlined and highlight this part. If you're breathing and you want to do it, you deserve it. Right. But it, but we all have our blocks and some people's blocks are around, do I deserve it? And so I'm just going to say you deserve it and you're going to have to do that work each person in themselves and you can just say in that you know that moment of decision our destiny is shaped you can just decide okay I deserve it so and get on with your day which would then lead us to the fourth hurdle which is committing and so a long time ago I heard a phrase that 100% commitment rocks but 99% commitment sucks when you've almost committed that's kind of the worst place to be it's like I really 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 want to be a chef I'm going to go to chef school and I'm going to do all these things, but I'm going to take an accounting class. Mm -hmm. That's not a hundred percent commitment. That's giving yourself an out. And it is not, it is not, you are not going to reap all the benefits of a hundred percent commitment until you actually go all in. And when you're all in, there's some invisible, amazing power in the universe that rises up to meet you that will cause these serendipitous connections and these magical moments and these mystical happenings to occur when you have gone all in. And I don't know what the mystical power is. Some people call it the law of attraction. Some people call it the force of the universe. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, I try to stay real friendly with it. (laughs) (laughs) Smart. (laughs) I sing fully committed to my process. And so it's kind of like being on a diet You can't exercise and eat the right things and not be in good shape and in good health. Mm. So I can't write the words every day. I get up every morning and I write the words. And sometimes they're good words and sometimes they're better than others. Sometimes not so much. But I can't write the words every day and not pump out content, not be consistent in my content creation. So I'm committed to the the butt-in-seat strategy. (laughs) <laughs> I like that. I'm like, I'm like smiling and kind of like waiting for you to go on. But I, I, I love that. Yes, you need to sit down and commit and do it. And I love the idea of not giving yourself an out because, you know, I'm, I'm, I love my, I love my little safety net. I'm addicted to my safety net. Mm. Well, and there is nothing wrong with being a pragmatist and being practical because I am both of those things. I am the practical prosperity practices person, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's like, you know, as you pray, move your feet. Don't sit at home and go, I am a writer, I am a writer, I am a writer, and then go to your bank job and then come home and go, why don't I have any book sales? Like, we don't have a book. You didn't write any words. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's, there are some practical actions that you have to combine with your prosperity thinking, with your abundance thinking, with your with your think, believe, deserve, commit. You have to put all of those things together with actually sitting and writing the words and learning how to write better. So you've got to have a good editor who's going to give you your words back and you've got to check your ego at the door because they're going to find all kinds of imperfections in what you thought might have been a perfect sentence and they're going to make you a better writer. And then you're going to publish one book and then you're going to write more words because you're getting up every day and you're writing some more words and then you're going to put out another book and it's, one thing needs leads to the next and you can't write all the words and stay committed to your process. And you'll notice I gave myself five years because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I didn't know there was no Kindle Gold Rush. There weren't a lot of self-publishing or publishing or writer podcasts in 2010. I think there were exactly zero. <laughs> <laughs> I remember listening to exactly zero podcasts on my treadmill in the morning when I was at the gym. And now I have... 20 that I listen to on 2x the speed because there are so many and they have such great information. So there's a lot of good mental food. So you cannot do all the right things and not get the right result eventually. And as long as you understand that it's eventually, it's not next week or next month, it might be. You might hit a lightning strike. You might write The Martian or Fifty Shades or The Girl on the Train or Gone Girl, right, that have become phenomena, that have become movies and t-shirts. And... You might still be getting up at six o'clock every day and writing the words like I am still. 
They're 12, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) And you know what? I love it. If I didn't love it, I wouldn't keep doing it. So it doesn't really matter. I make a good living. I love what I do. I'm talking to you. This is great. Oh, you're so wonderful. Awesome. Right? As far as I'm concerned, I'm living the dream. And if something else bigger happens, that'll be kind of fun too. But it's kind of tempering your expectations, staying committed to, to the work, increasing your prosperity consciousness as necessary and rinse and repeat. Speaking of beliefs and prosperity consciousness, I I love that phrase, actually, and I want to ask you about it. So so you talk a lot about beliefs. And um, one of the kind of catch words I have here is money stories. Mm. Can you explain what that is and why it's important? Yes, a money story is the thing that you tell yourself about money in your life. So how easily does money come to you or how hard is money to get? Who gets money more than you get money or do you get money more than other people? And so I had a money belief or a money story that didn't serve me. And it doesn't matter what it was or what yours is. If you recognize that you have something that you say around money, such as, Money is hard to come by or I have to work really hard for money. And if if writing is easy for you, after a while, it gets easier, right? It's like a skill, right? Get to Carnegie Hall, practice, 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 right? So (laughs) the same thing with writing. The more you do it, the better you get. The better you get, the more you do it, right? It's a self-repeating situation. So if one of the things that has happened for you is that you believed or the, the belief has been installed probably by your parents who meant well, right? But that money 1.0 program that was installed might be something like money is hard to come by or money doesn't grow on trees. Mm -hmm. But one of the the beliefs that I replaced was that money was hard to come by, that I had to work hard for money, right? That's what we're talking about. I'm a good Midwesterner and we work hard for money. So one of mine is every time I spend money, I'm like, oh, there's more where that came from. And I also say, as money goes out, immediately double the money comes in. So I don't really worry about spending money because I know that I've kind of enacted this law in my head, right? It's a belief. And it works. That's the fun part is that double the money is coming back to me. And now there's direct deposit. So it's instant. (laughs) (laughs) Which I love. Right. And one of the other ones, and I have my author buddy who I talk to almost every day. We're writing a couple of books together. And that's what we call each other, author buddy. And... (laughs) He'll say, where did the money come from today? Because I told him, I said, look, money comes to me every day. Money comes from somewhere every day. I will either find money, I will get a check in the mail, there will be a direct deposit. Now, let's not get crazy and think that it's large sums of money every day. And that's because that's where my prosperity consciousness is. But I will literally get, even if it's 12 cents from Amazon Germany, I'm getting money every day. And that's because I got rid of the belief that it was hard and installed the belief that it was easy. And so now it seems to be easier than it was before. That's so interesting. So many writers, I think, are afraid to talk about money and prosperity. And so I love that you're talking about it so openly. It's, it kind of bums me out that, that they're afraid to talk about it because it's only hurting them. And I'm not of the generation that is comfortable with, well, I made $237,000 last month, where there is a generation of people now who very much talk about how much money they made and they like do income reports. Mm -hmm. I would rather be naked in Macy's (laughs) noontime than do an income report. I mean, (laughs) that is so not going to happen because it seems a little obnoxious to me. It seems a little braggadocious. And that's just because I'm, you know, I'm a lady of a certain age. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, uh, that's just where my comfort level is. Where People are, I'm not judging anybody, right? I'm just saying what's comfortable for me. But I also think that at some point you have to just get comfortable with the thing that makes you uncomfortable. So it's almost a challenge to become comfortable with it in and of yourself. Not that you have to go and talk about it to other people, but you've got to be able to talk about it to yourself. You have to get smart with your money and respect your money. And part of what I see people doing is being afraid of money. They're afraid to earn it. And then if they do get some extra money, that it makes them nervous and so they get rid of it. So get your money in and then save some money, give some money away, right? Enact the laws of the universe and then use your money purposefully. And I think that's, that would do a lot to, to serve people, especially writers, because you really, you've been given a gift. If you can write, there are lots of people who can't write. There are a lot of writers 
you can throw a rock and hit a writer. <laughs> you can throw a rock and hit a hundred people that can't write and would wish for that gift. So if you have this gift, you've been given this gift from wherever it came from, right? God, the universe, whatever you believe. And so you're meant to share that gift with the world. So if you're not, if you're hiding your gift, then the whole world is missing out. And how many great books have you read that you were so excited that the writer actually wrote the book because it was so good? So many. Yes. Yes. When I, and I, I read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn when I was growing up a whole bunch of times. I just love the writer. We go back again and again to, the, to something that's well done. Well, that was from someone who had the courage to put their words on paper when maybe they didn't feel so courageous. And so now it's your turn. Thank you for saying that. That's so wonderful. Yay. <laughs> so talking about prosperous authors, you talk about the acronym FAME, F-A-M-E. Can you yeah. give us a peek into what that might mean? Yeah, so fame isn't what you might think, right? It's not, we're not going to be famous. Oh, gosh. Well, okay. <laughs> you can if you want to, but I always say rich, not famous. I would rather have lots of money and nobody know who I was than to be famous and not be able to go out in public. Yes, so, that would suck. <laughs> yes. Why? Well, I have your autograph. I think it would be cool like one time. <laughs> and then after that, I mean, like, don't you want to go? I want to go out without doing my hair. I want to go out with the scrunchie. Like, <laughs> yes. Oh, that's me every day. Yeah, right. Okay. So we're on the same page. Are you an introvert? I am so an introvert. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I get it. Yep. I love people. I love people, but I recharge by being by myself. Mm -hmm. Me so too. if I'm having to give a presentation and be public, I'm okay with that. But then I also want to come home and wear a scrunchie in my pajamas at four o'clock in the afternoon. Just saying. Yes. So, yes. So fame, each of the letters in fame stands for something. So I'll do one for each. So the, one of the F's in fame is focus. So successful, prosperous writers get focused and stay focused. So the, it's, it's my morning practice. I get up, I write the words. It's not sexy. It's not exciting. But you know what's exciting is how many words I write. Like how close to six did I get started? And then I go to 658 and I write as many words as I can in that time. And I like to write somewhere between 600 and say 2,500, 3,000 words, depending on if I'm typing, if I'm outlining, if I'm editing or I'm dictating. All of those things factor in. But I like the bigger number, right? We all like the bigger number. Yes. It's so to be successful and prosperous, you've got to have focus. So then the A would stand for attitude, and I know for a fact, because I know some really amazing, successful writers, that they have this unshakable belief and faith in themselves. Like, there is no plan B. They might have writing as their side hustle when they first start, but there's no doubt that it's going to be their main hustle at some point. Attitude is, like, rock solid. So then M has to stand for money consciousness, or something about money, right? And that it's just the very first step in money consciousness is, is realizing that money is energy and that money is available to you just like air is available to you and that you've never really probably done without money. Money might have been tight and it might have sometimes been more than others, but there's always money available to you. It's always coming. It's always in flow to you. So believing thinking, talking, and acting like it's okay, like amazingly okay, <laughs> to make money from your writing and that being prosperous is good. And when you think, if you can think about it, like if your best friend had a problem and they needed money, isn't it better if you can say, oh, sure, I'll take care of that for you? Oh, gosh, yeah. Right? So it's, you, it's doing good from your money. Money isn't good or bad. It's just what we the meaning that we give to it. So believe that it's good and that'll help you to have more come to you. And then finally, the E can stand for expectation as in positive expectation. So some people live in a perpetual negative state of expectation. Like I'm afraid or this, this or that's going to happen. Oh, like, like worriers and. Yeah. So I have clients even if in from my business coaching life who will say, you know, I've, I've done this deal and I'm afraid this is the last deal I'm ever going to do. And then the next time I talk to them, they're like, oh, I got a deal. Oh, <laughs> yay. <laughs> and then when that deal is over, they're like, well, I kind of think that was my last deal. <laughs> right. And so they they have in the back of their mind this fear, not that I'm like, look, why don't you have the expectation that right when you finish a deal that someone calls you and says, hey, in two weeks time, 
I'm going to give you another deal. And that will give you time to go to Cancun on vacation. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. <laughs> have the positive expectation that what you would really like to have happen is going to happen. Not the whole, the whole big worst thing that you can make up, right? The ugly monster under the bed is going to happen. So, so you believe that those, those expectations can really affect us. I do. I've done a, enough watching and experimenting and reading and studying of how our thoughts and our intentions inform and influence our results. And you can read books like E Cubed or E Squared by Pam Grout. And she'll say, put two seeds in two different potted little potted soil and then intend for one to grow and the other one to not grow. And the one you intend to grow will sprout faster. So there's something to be said for the power that you put behind something. And so when you've got this fear energy that the worst might happen, you're not doing yourself any favors. I'm not saying that you're, I, I don't think that the law of attraction is perfect. And there, thereby, I don't like to call it a law because a law is something that works every single time, no matter what. Mm, yeah. yeah. So it's not that the fear every single time is going to get you the, the worst result. But if you're going to hope and intend and pray and and think about something why not just say well i'm just going to let this work out and i have one little more asterisk thing that i that i <laughs> that i've decided recently which is that when something bad happens i can't decide that it's actually bad because it might be good ooh allah my divorce so we thought the divorce was bad but i have nine books that i wrote as a result of my divorce also known as Revenue for the whole rest of my life in 70 years after I die. I'm just saying. Yeah. So bad or good? <laughs> I think it's good. So I think when something not so good happens, it's a sign that something good is going to happen. And then when something good happens, that's also a sign that something good is going to happen. So I've decided that <laughs> recently. <laughs> I love that. What a beautiful mindset to have. Well, it takes the stress out of it. So when something bad happens, you think, oh, that's horrible. And then you don't know that it isn't a greater power than you that's making the way for something better to come. So I just choose to believe that. That's awesome. How did you make that choice? Mm, I, don't, I don't actually know the answer to that question. I think I just, it just made sense to me because I was talking through my divorce, right? And I had heard this tale of a, a farmer and it was whether it was good or bad. And he's like, I don't know, we'll see. And, you know, the, the horse kicked his son and broke his leg. And they said, oh, bad horse, you know, your poor son, like, can't do this thing. And he's like, I don't know, we'll see. And then when it came time for the draft, he oh. knelt to be drafted and go off to war. Oh, gosh. Right. So there were these all these things. And it, he was like, you know, you won the lottery. And it's like, we'll see if that good or bad. Right. And then it's like, oh, you owe these taxes. Well, that's bad. Well, we'll see. <laughs> Right. And so this tale went on for a long time and it made me realize that if something good happens, you can even you can make it be bad in some way if you want to. But why do that? And so it was really just an internal choice for me to decide, well, anything that that's not so great that happens could actually turn out to be amazing. And part of my philosophy is that rejection is protection, that when I don't get the thing that I really, really, really thought that I wanted it's most likely because something even more amazing is going to happen instead. What a wonderful message, though. It's sort of um, taking a long view of things and not letting those immediate setbacks or immediate quote unquote wins just affect you right away. It's sort of instilling hope in everything and taking a really long and strategic view of it. Yes. So wrapped up in the in the day to day drama of life. Is it a good thing? Is it not a good thing? Well, if if it's a good thing, I choose to see it as a good thing and as a sign that more good things are going to happen. And if it's a not so good thing, I'm thinking, well, it's got to be, there's got to be good in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, I love that. I, I want to start adopting this like right now. Okay. I'm going to do this. I want to go back to something you said earlier, and that was, you, you kind of hinted at giving something away. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's one of the underlying principles in your book as well. Can you tell me about... Um, I think the quote is, if you want something, give it away. Yes. Yes. This is part of my philosophy also. And if you have something that you want and you don't have it, as much of it as you want, then your best way to send it out into the universe so it will come back to you multiplied is to actually send it out into the universe so it will come back to you multiplied. Right? So we've all heard of karma, what mm -hmm. you put 
comes back to you multiplied. Well, that also works with hugs and money and kindness and good deeds. So I have a, a story around that, which is to this day, I can't believe the amount of blessing that's come from this. But I had decided um, in 2013 that I wanted more five-star reviews because that's what every author really wants, book sales and five-star reviews. And then I realized that I wasn't eating my own dog food that I wasn't reading books and giving them reviews. Now, my attitude on reviews is if it's a four-star or a five-star review, I give it. If it's a three-star or below, I don't say anything. Like along the lines of if you don't have something nice to say, right? Yeah. So the very next book that I read was a book called The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. And I thought it was a great book. So I got on Amazon and I wrote a five-star review and I got on Goodreads and I wrote a five-star review and I was quite proud of myself that I was now eating my own dog food. And a day or two later, I get a message from Hal that he had seen the review and was wondering if I would be interested in co-authoring The Miracle Morning for Single Moms. Oh my gosh. And I just had this intuitive yes. So I wrote him back and I said, let's talk about it. So we got on the phone the next day, I think a day or two later. And by the end of the conversation, he said, I think you're the person I've been looking for. I want to turn the Miracle Morning into the Miracle Morning book series. And I need someone who has the organizational skills and the understanding of what it takes to have a successful book series. And at the time I had six books, five or six books in the successful single mom book series. And so he had done a little due diligence on me and saw my background, right? Coaching, speaking, that sort of thing. So we partnered and I am now his partner in the Miracle Morning book series. And we have produced three books. We're about to release the Miracle Morning for writers. Really excited about with uh, Steve Scott is the co-author. And then we have two more that'll come out this year. And then we're going to go on a six to 12 book rotation every year of different niches for the Miracle Morning books. But my stake in that business is so amazingly abundant. And it was because I gave away that review. So I planted that one seed. And so much good has come back to me that I can hardly even connect that one small act of writing the review. Mm -hmm. The wonderful blessings, the people that I know, and my relationship with Hal and being a part of that brand and impacting lives stems from that, if you want something, give it away. And so an instant gratification version of that is a hug. If you want a hug, give a hug away. You want a friend, be friendly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you for some kind of small scale examples, but those are perfect. Yeah. So one of the things that I do is it, we do with the Miracle Morning books, but I also do with my royalties is we we give money away. So we give some of it to the Front Row Foundation. And, and some people call it tithing, which is a religious about it a little bit in prosperity, prosperity for writers. And I find some people have a real aversion to the religious connotation. So I've kind of made it a uh, secular, like you're just sowing good sar- karma seeds, right? It doesn't have yeah. to do with religion. Although if it is, and you're comfortable with that, that's the basis of which I came to it. Yeah. So I'm not opposed to it, but I take a, a portion of my money and I give it away and I become a blessing, right? I'm blessed. And so I become a blessing and I keep the, the flow going. Whatever it is that you want, what that specific thing, like if you want Um, money, you don't give away time. Interesting. (laughs) If you want money, then you give money. Some people go, I'm not going to give up my money, but I'll give up my time. And I think people are confused about what's more precious because you can always get more money, but you can't get more time. Once you've spent time, it's gone. So for me, keeping the cycle of abundance coming is I give away a portion of every dollar that comes to me. And I can't log on to Chase fast enough. (laughs) deposit I'm like okay we're gonna keep that cycle going oh what a wonderful way to live and what a wonderful example to set for other writers and just for anybody well and it doesn't have to be a large portion I talk about in the book 10 percent right which is a tithe is a, a tithe is technically a tenth but in order to start the flow going to start the magic like give away one percent and if you get a dollar take a penny and give it away if you get a hundred dollars, take a dollar and give it away and then watch what happens because you'll get addicted to it. Like I am where I can't wait to do that. And so that's where I think, you know, you, you don't hoard the words, 
don't hoard the hugs, don't hoard the dollars because it's what you put out comes back to you multiplied. So every time money goes out immediately, twice the money comes in. And that's just when you're buying a taco. (laughs) 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 right? But when you're a blessing, when you're actually giving your money away as a blessing, then it just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming and in bigger and bigger amounts until you can't even believe where you started. But it all starts with one, one small act just to do it for you know, do it for a week or two weeks or a month or six months and just see if it works. And if it doesn't work for you, and it will, but if it doesn't, then don't do it. That just like, makes it so easy. Yeah, try, if you try, try being happy. If you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop. Yeah. You can stop anytime. <laughs> and yet when you try it and it works, you'll get addicted to it. And then you can't wait to do it. That's the fun. Mm, I That's love it. It comes from, and then you get into kind of a better place. I mean, life isn't perfect, but it certainly is better when you can look at things a certain way and do things in a certain way. Especially when, when I know that when I'm giving away money, that it's benefiting someone else, and they might not have had that benefit if I hadn't shared my wealth. I could have just held on to it. And I think good gets dammed up, right? It gets like hoarding. Mm -hmm. You have to keep things in the flow. If you're just hoarding, then that's problematic. So let some go and see what happens. Even if you do, I love going into Starbucks and giving the register person 20 bucks and then just having them buy coffee for people that what whoever's next in line, but I don't get credit for it. I'm not doing it for accolades or or thank yous. I just want to see how people respond to it. Do you like stick around and see? Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm writing. Sometimes I'm just hanging out with Starbucks and I just want to see how people react. And the funny thing is, is someone to say, oh, the, uh, someone in front of you bought your coffee and they look around. They're like, Who did it? <laughs> <laughs> and some people actually will pull a 20 out and go, I'm going to get into this too. Oh, that's, that's fun. yeah. Yeah. That's really fun. That's awesome. So oh, with that, start with giving, if you want a cup of coffee away, give away coffee, right? Just have a little fun with it. Make it an experiment. Don't overthink it. Don't get too inside your head or analytical about it. Just have some fun with it. Have fun with your money because the more fun you have, the more your subconscious mind associates fun with money and doing what you love with money. And so then you get more of it and it's self-perpetuating. So I'm interested. I think this might be the last question before I ask you about where people can buy your book in the accompanying journal. But I want to know if you have any mentors in your life that sort of taught you some of these principles. A lot. Everyone is actually my mentor. (laughs) I literally learn something from everyone. So Mark Victor Hansen, who was the co-author of The Chicken Soup for the Soul, he was the mentor that told me to write. And then I met Jeffrey Gittimer, who told me that my writing was good and that my book cover sucked and it needed to (laughs) break in, which was the best thing. Now when someone hires me to work with them, Right. I come at it from like a global 360, 30,000 foot perspective. Right. What do you want from this book? What's the message? How where where do you want to create income streams and that sort of thing? Then I have to sometimes tell them that their baby is ugly Mm. and I have to do it in such a way that it's like it's first of all, it's not a baby. (laughs) You're not your darlings. Every, everybody's going to be fine and good books aren't written. They're rewritten and edited. So slow your roll. Calm down. (laughs) I'm like, let's back up a little bit and come at this from a little bit more of a practical perspective, right? But I, but every single person that I've ever come in contact with has been my mentor in one way or another. Sometimes awesome, sometimes a what not to do. Mm, <laughs> fair, yeah. Yeah, but I've had many, many, many mentors because of all the podcasts we can listen to and because of all the books that we can read. And audiobooks that we can listen to. I have so many mentors. And it's fun to at some point cross paths with your mentors and be able to thank them. Yes. I love that you talk about abundance, not only with like writing and money, but also you have an abundance of mentors. And I think that's such a gorgeous attitude to have about it. Well, I think you can learn something from everyone. Even if someone is, you know, 22 years old, and they're just cranking out books like crazy. There's something to be said for youth and exuberance mm-hmm. and enthusiasm. And why do I not have that? <laughs> yeah. I don't have that? Who says I can't have that? Or watching someone, you know, I'm a big fan of Matt Morris of the, the uh, Author Strong podcast. And he is well known for his 50,000 word writing binges in a day. Oh, my gosh. 
<laughs> so you think, wow, I can't really do a thousand words. It's like, yes, you can. <laughs> because if he can do 50,000 words, like we can, we can eke out an easy grand, right? <laughs> just... Totally. Yeah. So he's a mentor. There's an abundance of mentors. You're so right. I hadn't thought of it that way. I love that though. I think that that is such a, such a gorgeous message to share. If people are interested in getting a copy of Prosperity for Writers, a writer's guide to creating abundance and the accompanying journal, uh, where can they go for that? They can go to Amazon. Awesome. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And they can also get a couple of free chapters um, of the book if they are so inclined to check it out first before they buy. I understand that. So honorayquarter.com forward slash writers will give them two free chapters and then put them on my list of prosperity goodness. And I only send something to that list like every two weeks. So I'm not harassing people every day like Banana Republic. Oh my gosh, I know, right? <laughs> every day is the last day of the sale at the limited. Every day. Every day. Yes. Well, it's very funny now because I, my husband will, I'll say, oh, I love that sweater. My husband will say, get it. And I'll say, if I wait a couple of days, it'll be 40% off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have an abundance of patience. Well, <laughs> going 40% off. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Honore, it has been such an honor and a pleasure to talk to you today. You have so much wisdom. You have so much joy. And I love, I don't know, you you have that exuberant spirit that you were talking about earlier. And you just have this, um, this sense of abundance about you that is just absolutely intoxicating and contagious. And so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your insights with us today. I am just humbled by your words. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been such a pleasure talking with you. Oh my gosh, you too. 